What's up, baseball fans? It's your boy, Clancy, back again on this episode of Pin Pals. I'm here with my esteemed bullpen aficionados, the boys, Mr. Dowdy and Mr. Duke. What's going on, fellas? Living life. Living life, Mr. Clancy. Dowdy, how are you doing? Man, we are just enjoying every day. We're getting closer and closer to baseball season. We're still waiting for some free agents to fall, but we have way cooler topics to talk about today. Yes, we That's do. That's right. Uh, today, in light of last week's events, this is a hot-button topic. I know all three of us get kind of heated about this to a certain extent because I feel like the hypocrisy is deafening. This is going to be the Hall of Fame episode. Ooh. So, unless you've been living... Under a rock for the past week, two weeks, uh, the 2024 Hall of Fame class has been announced. It is uh, three players voted on by the writers and one from the ERA committee, now it's called. So mm -hmm. we've got Adrian Beltre, first ballot. Todd Helton uh, makes in six year on the ballot. Joe Maurer, first ballot Hall of Famer. And... I give love to the managers because the good ones are a dime or diamonds in the rough. Jim Leland's in as well. So yes. much love and respect to those four. Um, I personally think all four are warranted. I have no problem with any of these four getting in. Um, Adrian Beltre, 3,000 hits. That's probably a lock under most metrics, which we'll dive into later. Uh, Joe Maurer, first ballot Hall of Famer. I could probably get into the weeds and make an argument of, I definitely think Joe Maurer's a Hall of Famer. He probably could have sat another year or two and not hurt anybody's feelings. And then probably what I think is the most controversial one, Todd Helton um, got in with almost 80% of the votes. What do you guys think about these three? Do you have any quarrel, any, any thoughts on these guys that you want to throw out there? Man, personally, I think all three make it in absolutely at any time in their 10 years of possible voting. They defined a generation of baseball without a doubt. Uh, they all have the numbers to go with it. Joe Maurer was like the first catcher in my mind that it's like, whoa, okay, you've got a catcher that really swings it and he plays solid D back there. And he did it for what, like 13 seasons, something crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm bought in on Joe Maurer. Again, first ballot. I, I could argue that. He crept in with 76%. But again, yeah, all three are Hall of Famers in my mind. I know. I couldn't agree more. Uh, all three definitely deserved Hall of Famers. You mentioned Adrian Beltre, 3,000 home runs or 3,000 hits. Sorry. 3,000 hits. That is definitely a mark, a benchmark to getting into the Hall of Fame. I would equivalent that to the 500 home run mark, um, which will help me transition to my next topic. Uh, but all three of those guys definitely warranted it. Uh, I think Adrian Beltre and um, Maurer were locks for this year. Uh, Helton being as controversial, I don't think it has anything to do with him as a player, his statistics. Uh, I think it has everything to do with the field and with the other names on the ballot. Uh, that's why it comes across controversial. Being a Houston guy, being a native, and not seeing Billy Wags get the nod uh, and seeing Todd Helton get it over him, that's what fuels me to put a little bit more emphasis on, eh, I wouldn't have gone with Helton as a first ballot this year, uh, but that's just how that's just how the dime or just how things fell. Uh, but speaking of 500 home runs, I can get on a soapbox forever and talk about the Hall of Fame committee and talk about the big home run hitters, the players that defined two decades worth of a generation of baseball that are being snubbed and likely will be snubbed for the rest of their lives and the rest of their careers. But uh, we can dive into that a little later on. We'll we'll get into that. That's very much on the topic or the docket. Excuse me. Um, I guess looking at it now, the name that is probably most controversial, or at least I've had the most discussions about, is Todd Helton, yeah. just because he played half his games in Denver. What kind of, do we say tarnish, does that put on a legacy? It's not asterisk worthy, right? Like, you definitely can't punish a guy for being drafted by a team, spending his entire career with a team. Mm -hmm. But do you guys think he maybe should have sat on the ballot longer? in light of his location to that extent? 
What are the thoughts on that? Well, I'll go ahead and say you could throw you could technically throw a tarnisher and asterisk on a lot of players, just like every red every New York Yankee, every Boston Red Sox playing in Fenway, but I'm gonna hone in a little bit more on the Yankees just a little, a little bit of bad blood there, but well, that's neither here nor there. Uh, but playing half of your games every year in Yankee Stadium, I mean, you don't have the you don't have the thin air like you do in Denver, but you've got a short porch. I mean, you're seeing guys like Judge and Stanton nowadays hitting balls two inches above their top fist uh, and being able to punch it over. 302 feet over the left field wall or 316 feet over a 315 wall in right field. Uh, I think that could warrant a tarnish as well. But I think once you, once you put a tarnish or a little asterisk or a little uh, on somebody, you can get really granular and do it to everybody. And uh, the reason (laughs) that I believe that again, keep going back to the steroid era of baseball that's what everybody likes to put the tarnish and the asterisks on. And that's why I would say you can't put somebody on one, put one on, on one player and then not include it with the crowd. Yeah. I think absolutely the, that thought process with Helton stays true. Where it's like, you can't tarnish or retract from what his career was purely because of where he played. Like there's hitter friendly ballparks all over the place. You look at great American ballpark. That's a hitter friendly ballpark. You have a ton of guys that play there for their whole career. We don't penalize mm-hmm. them. Like, that's just not fair. It wasn't exactly. their choice the whole time. So it, to say that is disingenuous. But now when you look at just numbers, and if we're going to be a little antsy about guys hitting in certain ballparks, you've got guys with much better numbers that are sitting on ballots because of other issues mm-hmm. that writers clearly take offense to. Right. Yep. And, and I'll <laughs> go go ahead, Duke. I was gonna say I, I wouldn't put the tarnish uh, like on the negative side, like a hitter hitting in a hitter friendly park. Uh, but on that same token, I would give like a little nod of positivity to where like a pitcher pitching for my most majority of his career at my, at the Mile High Stadium in Denver, like that's. That, that that warrants a level of positivity. I wouldn't go negative, but I would go positive. Like you see pitchers that spend majority of their career in Boston or New York, and you can get a, an elevated fly ball can easily find its way in the first or second row and 90% of the other ballparks in the country. That's a root, can of corn routine fly ball. So I'd, I would give it on the positive side, but I'm, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. Uh, I want to make that known now because it may not look like it here in about 15 minutes, but uh, I would give, I would give some positive, like an attaboy type asterisks to the pitchers that are pitching in these hitter friendly parks. I would agree. The, the answer to that is I can't think of has, – has a Rocky ever won the Cy Young? <laughs> no. Uh, that is an Ubaldo interesting Jimenez fact. Ubaldo Jimenez probably got Ubal- close. Yeah. Okay. okay. If he didn't win it, he was a runner-up. Yeah. Okay. But outside of that, I can't think – weird uh, high low splitter guy that, yeah, that's the only thing that's going to play there. Beauty of playing half your games on the road, I guess. Uh, back on the topic, even to validate Todd Helton, I think I – I love that baseball is headed in a direction where we collect and we use all the data we can get our hands on. But that being said, there's a trade-off in that there's a statistic for everything. When it comes to the Hall of Fame, I'm going old school. I'm looking at batting average. I'm looking at home runs. I'm looking at RBIs. I'm looking at stolen bases, uh, for hitters at least. Um, Todd Helton's is a career 316 hitter. That in itself, I think is Hall of Fame worthy. Um, So, yeah, I'm all aboard, all in favor of this class. Yep. You get a nod from the boys. Congratulations uh, to them. But that being said, we kind of started talking about numbers a little bit. What are some metrics you guys think outside of the 3,000 hits? Because we've already established Mm -hmm. that. What's an automatic bid into the hall if you hit a certain – number metric you guys got a home run number you guys got an rbi number um for pitchers you got a strikeout number wins anything of that nature so pitchers of course you're going to look at era first and foremost i would say anybody anybody that's thrown good lord i can't put a metrics to how many innings but uh substantial like two to three hundred career innings in the major leagues or 
10 plus seasons is an easy metric as well uh, with a career ERA under three deserves consideration Two under two point under two, five is pretty automatic. I mean, you see a guy with a 10 plus year career that it's chucked a sub two, five ERA over the course of his entire career. That's, that's about as automatic as 3000 hits in my mind. Um, so that's, and then of course, I don't want to base it solely on this, but pe- of course it's a, it's a factor Cy Young awards. Um, you see so many times that pitchers don't have as many Cy Youngs as say a Roger Clemens that racked up seven over his career, just because there's so much talent on the mound in today's day and age where you see a guy have an unbelievable year and finish as a runner up just because he's won it two out of the last three years. I mean, if you, uh, if you let him go a full year, it's going to be hard to argue not to give it to Jacob deGrom every single season with his stuff and the stats he puts up, but you, you got it. MLB doesn't want to admit it. They're going to spread the wealth a little bit, just introduce some variety. And then also there's a lot of guys that warrant it. So it's a factor, but it's not the factor. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, th- there are some really interesting stats to get into. I think war is fun to look at while it's not a deciding factor in this, simply because you kind of get an idea of how crucial they were Mm -hmm. to the team versus like the average player at their position in those years, where it's like, yeah, you can act like the ballpark or the steroids or whatever it was made this huge difference in them, but they are that much better on a year in year out basis Mm -hmm. where you look at a guy like, we'll just take Helton. Helton's got an almost 62 war over his career. So that means compared to the average first baseman for the length of his career, which I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say he had 13, 14 years of service time. Mm-hmm. So he's yeah, averaging man. over six wins better than the average first baseman for every one of those years. That's crazy. Unbelievable. Like we're looking at Alex Bregman right now getting about a three to four war, and that's a good year. Oh, yeah. Three to four, three to four over the course of a 10 plus year career puts you on the ballot. Does it get yeah. you a win? Maybe, maybe not. But that, just to put it in perspective, that's what kind of impact he had. And I think you bring up war. I am very, very intrigued to see war becoming a, a major factor or a decision maker in who gets on the ballot and ultimately who receives votes and come in because it wasn't something that – it's not a, it's not an old metric. It's something that's been brought on the last five, ten years that, you know, think about the – the players in the 90s and 2000s. Think about what Pedro Martinez wore back when the Boston Red Sox days. Think about Clemens on the Yankees days. Like you, you go back to guys like that, their war is through the roof and they're absolutely warranted of a Hall of Fame spot. But one of the guys didn't that I mentioned didn't get one. We'll get to that later too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was just looking at that and I'm like, man, there's a guy that sat on the ballot for a little while now and he's got uh, 117 war. And 3,000 hits mm-hmm. and almost 700 home runs. Mm-hmm. And he's just sitting there with 30% mm-hmm. of the vote. I'm excited when we get we get a little further Ouch. into it. I want to give all yeah. of us give their uh, all of us give their top. It could be one or two, but top player that is top Hall of Fame snub. Let's call it. Okay. I'm gonna. Well, let's let's kind of start heading that direction. I'm gonna play a little game with you boys. I'm gonna list out the stats for two players. I'm not giving you a name. One is a Hall of Famer. One is not. I'm gonna let you guys predict which one's the Hall of Famer. You can guess the player if you can guess it. More power to you. Okay. But player one, a career batting average of two ninety two. 509 career home runs, 1,676 RBIs, and 253 stolen bases. Nice, right? It's pretty. Player two, career batting average of 316, 369 career home runs, 1,406 RBIs, and 37 stolen bases. Which one's the Hall of Famer? Just based off of what what we're talking about, I'm going to go on a limb and say the second one is the Hall of Famer. Uh, but that's just my that's just my educated guess. Um, but based on those stat lines, uh, first one, if he's not the Hall of Famer, 
I'm going to be very agitated uh, when you tell me who it is because that kind of stat line, that deserves, that's first ballot numbers. I mean, almost 8.08 away from career 300 with 500 dingers and 250 plus stolen bases. Yeah, that's, come on. What you got, Dottie? What do you think? Yeah, so I have looked at this Hall of Fame class a little bit too closely, so I know who number two is. Mm. But number one, I mean, dude, what else do you have to do? Like, I don't know how long your career was, but that is production to a T, my friend. Well, right. well done. Round of applause. Right. So, uh, Dowdy knows. I'll go ahead and throw it out there. Player two is the Hall of Famer. It's Todd Helton. Todd Helton. Okay. Uh, I did player one to appease our buddy uh, Jet Boyer a little bit. Player one is Gary Sheffield, who could have guessed falls off the roster or falls off the ballot this year, I believe. Will not get into the Hall of Fame because of ludicrous. Yeah. Unless the Veterans Committee or the Air Committee, whatever it is now, hops in and helps him out. He is not a Hall of Famer. So this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. And Daddy and I talked about this a little bit earlier. The point of the Hall of Fame is to tell the story of the greatest players of each era of baseball. Yep. That's it. I understand we look at the steroid era and we're like, oh, that's that's cheating. Yes, that doesn't stop the story. The story is still told. We grew up in that era where all those players, yes, not doing what they're supposed to be doing, but it's written in the history books. You can put an asterisk next to that name if you have to. Yep. That has no effect on the hall whatsoever, in my opinion. Nope. So Couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah, the, that's my stance on all of this. We'll dive deeper into it. Give you guys a second. Yeah. You each grab it. Put your piece out there. What you think? And I think what a casual fan completely misses on this, baseball was okay with steroid use. They were like, dude, we're raking in the money. This is home runs. This is guys throwing harder. Fans are watching the game. This was the heyday of baseball. You had the home run chases. Everybody was watching. No one could take their eyes off Sosa and McGuire. Now we're going to penalize them for it? Like, dude, they were just providing the product you wanted. Like, what? I don't understand. You never said out and out, like, this is unacceptable. We can't allow this. You knew what was going on. These guys came in at 180 pounds and left at 250. Like, what are we doing? Yeah, you you don't you don't gain just casually gain twenty plus pounds of muscle in one off season. I mean, you can't lose that amount of weight even when you're three hundred plus pounds in that amount of time in an off season. Much less build lean muscle, which is even harder to do in most instances. Uh, but while we're on this topic and soapbox, I completely agree with what y'all are saying. The metric should be. Who like it's obviously to statistics are the baseline. That's what you base everything off of. But the best thing is, best metric is the impact on the game, the impact on the game itself, and the impact on the fan base. Uh, I'm a little fired up hearing that 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 number is that first player that player one was Gary Sheffield, and that he will never be a Hall of Famer unless a certain exception happens. Because I can't think of a player, uh, even in today's day and age, that doesn't play around in the backyard or on the in the sandlot emulating Gary Stan, uh, Gary Sheffield's iconic batting stance. The impact that he had on the game and how what he drove to the game, the fact that he's not a Hall of Famer is absolutely ludicrous. And if the MLB wants to penalize the steroid users that, like you both said, it was acceptable in that day and time, why are we not punishing guys in today's day and age with the juiced balls and the shorter ballparks – and the juiced bats. Nobody wants to talk about that. Oh, but those are, that's not the player's fault. That's the league mandate. The league chooses what baseballs you use. They, they put restrictions on bats. They put restrictions on field dimensions based on market and a, a bunch of other factors. Well, they had every ability to restrict steroid use too, but they didn't. In fact, they encouraged it. Because what is MLB about at the end of the day? It's about money. It's about ratings. It's about getting people to watch, or as they'll call it in the politically correct politically correct phrase, growing the game. You're growing. (laughs) 
you're growing the game by garnering more eyes and true baseball fans can appreciate the art and the nuance of a pitcher's duel or a low scoring battle and not view it as boring, but to appeal to a master audience, you want the high, you want the high flyers. You want the speed demons. You want the power guys. You want the long ball. You want the guys throwing a hundred plus at the expense of the players. Awesome. But now you're going to penalize them for doing what they can to their body to play a 160 game season and be able to bounce back and give you the product that you are wanting to push on the field to grow the game. I'll counter that with my own politically for, politically correct phrase. Grow up. If you gave every one of these players the option to have their name etched in Cooperstown for the rest of their lives and for the rest of history, but they have a little asterisk next to them, they'd sign on the dotted line tomorrow. They're a part of history. They will never be forgotten, even though you're trying to get us to forget them. Grow up. Yeah, 100%. Couldn't agree more. It's absolutely crazy. Because then we get to the point of like, where does the buck stop? Because bingo, we MLB has part of this. They have loaded the baseballs to this point, which then drove pitchers to try and find a way to be nastier mm -hmm. using slicker baseballs with smaller seams. Mm -hmm. So pitchers inevitably try to get a better grip. Again, this is all hearsay. Oh, no proof of any of this happening. Oh. So what happens to all these pitchers that were using sticky stuff or a foreign substance, which again has been used throughout baseball history. Mm -hmm. You've got video of guys back in the 70s using emery boards to scuff baseball. Now we're going to say something's wrong? Like, bro, come on. Like, like my good friend Travis said, grow up. I know it's obviously harder. As two former pitchers, Clancy, I'll throw you in at three. I know you were a pitcher in your heyday, too. As three former pitchers, we can all agree hitting is a lot harder than pitching. Hitting is one of the toughest things, if not the toughest thing to do in sports. But at what point do you stop catering to the hitters so much and penalizing the pitchers? And then while you cater to the hitters, you hold them accountable to the things that you're using to cater to them. Like, oh, a hitter hitter can use pine tar on a bat for a better grip, and you're going to change the baseball and juice them up so they have a better – but pitchers aren't allowed to use pine tar to get a better grip on a baseball. They're not allowed to use sunscreen and rosin or maybe a little maybe a little snot booger to get a little extra spin on the ball to make their pitches move a little bit more. That's not allowed. We're going to have pitchers pull their pants down in between every inning to check and make sure that they're not using illegal substances. But then on the same token, we're going to juice the ball league-wide to induce more home runs. Grow up. Either it's good across the board or it's not. We go back to the beer and hot dogs days of baseball where nothing was allowed. Or we let, let the players run wild, let them do what they want, their body, their choice, and let them do whatever they want to do and grow the game. <laughs> the sad reality is, too, is that because we're all in the Houston area, or at least our fandoms lie in the Houston area, there's going to come a time, too, when all five foot seven of Jose Altuve uh, makes it onto the ballot, and all anybody's going to remember is 2017. And the scandal that goes with that. And so you tell me you can you can't tell the story of the twenty tens up to current day baseball without talking about Jose Altuve. It's yep. not possible. No. Astros are in a dynasty and you're gonna exclude a guy because you pinned it all on the Astros. You didn't make the Yankees open the letter. Mm -hmm. You ignored the fact that the Red Sox had Apple watches at second base. Ooh. All this stuff that was out there that is just Dodgers guys relaying signs that we just magically <laughs> forgot about. <laughs> stop. I agree. The hypocrisy. And we can even stop. We're talking about the guys that aren't going to get in. Let's talk mm -hmm. about the guys that are in. Mm -hmm. The Veterans Committee led in a fellow. I'm going to read off the numbers for you, and then we'll go into names. Let in a guy, I guess, four years ago now. Here's the numbers on this guy. This guy came into baseball at age 21, retired at age 42. So, 21 years in baseball. Guy doubled his age in the game. Service time. Holy moly. <laughs> exactly. Career war of 38.8. Okay. Better than me walking off the street. Good. Better than most. Almost 10,000. 38 at 21 years. That's crazy. 
Yes. Like that's yeah. not like a generational talent type player. So let's no. Just moving forward, Dave. <laughs> Getting Screw close it. to ten thousand career at bats, nine thousand nine hundred and eight. Does not have three thousand hits. Has a little over twenty eight hundred hits. Has three hundred and eighty four home runs. A two eighty nine batting average. One thousand six hundred and twenty eight RBIs and thirty four stolen bases. This individual is none other than Harold Baines, who the Veterans Committee put in a few years ago. Hmm. You are going to put allow Harold Baines into the Hall of Fame, but Barry Bonds is out, A Rod's out, McGuire's out, Clemens is out, Schilling's out, Pettit's out, Pettit's out. Are you kidding me? <laughs> this is a joke. And the reality is, is you've dug a hole. You can't fix this. You mm -hmm. can't call a Harold Baines up and go, psych, five years later and rip his plaque off the wall. No. Nope. You cannot fix this. You have royally messed this up to where uh, you're going to have to establish another committee for the committees to try <laughs> to undo everything that they've already done. Every, all the committees. All the committees. And the bet. Guys, I swear, right hand to the man above, I watched Tony La Russa get on high heat with Chris Russo and defend this action. Got on there, it was like, well, we're the managers, we know the players better than everyone. No, the Veterans Committee is for the things the fans can't see. That's for managers, that's for GMs, that's for umpires maybe, anybody else that worked in the front office that would have worked with the players that we don't really get to see or work with. That's fine. I'm all for that. The writers work with the players. Harold Baines is not Hall of Fame material. This is a joke. This is completely ridiculous. So I don't... I'm pissed now. Throw it back to you guys. How do we fix the Hall? I love it. The, the, as baseball guys, it's coursing through our veins. This Hall of Fame talk, like we knew coming in, we were going to get fired up. We really did. And it fires me up because, and I feel bad for Harold Baines because, in my opinion, this isn't so much of a conversation around his. He was a, me he was a mediocre player at best. He doesn't deserve to get in. His stat line deserve, deserved to put him on the ballot. And just being on the ballot of to become a potential Hall of Famer is a huge, huge honor in of itself. Our point is, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Mr. Clancy, at least my point is. It's about the players that you're leaving out so you can get a player like this in. And it would be a complete different story if your name got to stay on the ballot forever. And you had an infinity sign of chances to get into the Hall of Fame where they could potentially correct this mistake and not taking Harold Baines's plaque away, but by giving the players that deserve to get into the Hall of Fame a fair chance, but all of the players that Clancy mentioned, their name is fallen off the ballot, meaning they have no chance of getting into the hall of fame unless the committee who oversees the committee, who oversees the committee who decides who gets in makes a decision and says, we're going to go back and we're going to put their names back on the ballot and make exceptions and try to try to write this, which they'll never do. That's the main issue here. The mistakes that have been made are the people left out for egregious purposes. And like we hinted on earlier when we were talking about uh, an asterisk for playing in a stadium that's very hitter friendly or very thin air, putting an asterisk next to these guys that hit literally, literally the game's best home run hitters at a time where the home run ball was king. Yes, the, 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 league man, the league did not mandate or restrict steroid use. And at the end of the day, the X factor is you still have to hit a round ball with a round bat moving every which way with less than time than it takes to blink an eye to hit, to react and swing at. I don't care what you're injecting into yourself. That in itself is extremely, extremely difficult. So sorry, Harold Baines. Hate, I hate that you're the example for this, but it is... It's egregious that a stat line like that can get in, but our game's leading career home run hitters and single season home run record holder doesn't get in, but a stat line like this does. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not even going to go with like my top two or three that should be in at this point. I'm going to go down the list a little bit. This guy is on his eighth turn of voting. He got 
let's see, 32 and a half percent. He has a career 69 war. He played 19 seasons. He hit, let's see, 555 home runs, 2,500 plus hits. And let's see, career batting average of 312. That seem, seem good enough? It's A-Rod, yeah. No, that's Manny. A-Rod, oh. better numbers. <laughs> that's why I was like, hang on. This guy's on his eighth ballot and is getting no love still. Which I'm not even sure Manny has a positive test in his like history. Like, There's a lot of suspicion. Don't get mm-hmm. me wrong. Sure. This, mm-hmm. Let's not forget, this guy went overseas and kept playing until he was like 44 years old. Like, the guy's just a savage. How does this guy not define our generation? Mm-hmm. And then you go, yes, up the ladder, and you have an A-Rod whose numbers are even more insane, who played longer than Harold Baines, had nearly double the war of Harold Baines. Like, huh? I, yep. I just don't get me worked up on this stuff. And oh, even no. in the name of... In the name of consistency, too. If the era committee is for the players <clears> we <throat> can't see or the managers, whatnot, these guys, they're dead in the water. They are not mm-hmm. getting into the hall at all. That committee can't get them in. It was up to the 300 yeah. this year, 389 riders to get some of these in, and 292 yep. of them had to believe they were Hall of Fame worthy. I That's ridiculous. <laughs> We're at a point too, like a lot of guys will publicize their, they'll publicize their ballots and they'll vote for one of them because they were buddies. Oh, this guy, this guy would give me feeds or whatever. When I was riding out of the, in the locker room or whatever, he always stopped to talk to me. So it's political. It's not even, Mm -hmm. some of it's done out of like favoritism. There's no accountability for this whatsoever. No, no. And I think that there's fueling off of that. I think that there does need to be an exercise in the Hall of Fame and on vote on ballot voting where you strip the names of the players off and it goes off a stat line, completely blind. Keep it about you want to you want to make it very interesting. You can have two types of voting. You can have the like just sheerly voting on a name, and you have your own research and you have your stati- their statistics at your beck and call. And then one ballot, it's literally just their stat line. They're just player A. Boom, here's their stat line. Career stat line. Player B, here's their career stat line. We don't make the Hall of Fame a popularity contest. Don't make it a politically Bingo. correct contest. Uh, don't make it unfair for players that, you know, maybe they were not the best or most favored locker room guys because they were just intense. And if you talk to them on the day that they were starting or when they were in a slump, they'd attack you with a wooden bat. Like maybe they're not, fa- maybe they're not a favorite in the locker room, but they defined a generation in, when they were playing. But my biggest question is with the, with the hall of fame is where does it end? Because just like you're putting an asterisk on guys, like I'm going to do, I'm just going to stay with pitchers. Cause that's what I know best. And that's what I've studied my rear off my entire life but when you have somebody like roger clements his career stat line is egregiously better than almost all pitchers that have played the game seven cy youngs that's the most in history you know who doesn't have seven cy youngs randy johnson randy johnson only has five that's the second place you know who doesn't have seven cy youngs greg maddox another all-time generational great only has four Cy Youngs. But I'm going to go ahead and skip down to a player at number three and say, do you think Max Scherzer deserves to get into the Hall of Fame? My eyes? Absolutely he does. But how many times has he caught cheating with illegal substances on his wrist and his gloves? Hall of Fame, balls in your court. Are you going to put an asterisk next to his name? Are you going to let him in? Or is he going to be held back because of cheating scandals? Yeah, and awesome. if we want to go the sticky, if we want to go the sticky stuff route, then we also have to shift into like the abusing of Adderall or Vyvanse or anything that makes you just a little bit sharper to hit that round ball with that uh-huh. round bat or lock in on the catch. And Mr. And, and Mr. Dowdy, let me ask you a baseball question too. You may or may not know the answer to it, but at what point did Major League Baseball stop drug testing for players for marijuana? Uh, I believe it was 2022 was the first year. So prior to that, players would get popped or fail drug tests for marijuana and suspended games that have then come out of their career and tarnished their reputation. Does that now get lifted? Because 
marijuana is legal in the major leagues now? No. Where does it stop? But even to stay with that and consistency, if you go historically, everybody loved the 80s. Daryl Strawberry coked out of his mind, legging hits out. Like, how many extra doubles did he get out of that? Now, Daryl Strawberry is not a Hall of Famer. Doc Gooden, that era too. There's no way to constantly know everybody per era was doing mm-hmm. what. And even as, as strict as, well, this is something we need to marinate on too, as strict as the league is about testing of certain things too, it's not uncommon, like, Dowdy would be the one to pick on and ask. Because how easy is it for, we acknowledge the time of year we're in, you have an off-season routine. You walk into GNC to get pump powder, whatever, generic brand A, that you're trying to put on muscle during the off-season. You go pick this up. Mm-hmm. Nothing wrong with that. You do your routine, league tests you, and you test positive. There's a legitimate danger of that, is there not? Oh, it, there's more than a danger. It is incredibly common, so much so that organizations have now made it so that they will only supply athletes with NSF certified uh, products because they know it's tested. They know they have to meet certain standards and criteria. Again, if you go to your local GNC to get a pre-workout and you pop positive because of the pre-workout has traces of steroids, because somebody didn't clean the vat that it was mixed in and something scary was mixed in it beforehand. How is that fair? Like, again, I'm not saying that negligence on the athlete's part means that they should be allowed to do these things. Like MLB has made the rule. I get it. But they're also forcing the athlete to spend an extra 20 bucks on NSF certified products instead of what's readily available. Like it, there's got to be some give and take here, folks. Mm-hmm. And again, just to go back to the Adderall thing, Adderall Vivans, you had an entire generation of players from the 80s through the 90s that had an option in the clubhouse of regular coffee or greenies coffee, amphetamines, the same thing as Adderall and Vivans. No one wants to say a thing about that generation of player that was taking these things on a nightly basis. Not to mention that half of them developed to be alcoholics because you have to ride the high and then you have to somehow come down and go to sleep. So it's like, we're just going to wash our hands of that MLB. Okay, that makes sense. Where's the, where's the list for that? Where's the patented list of names for that MLB? There's not because then you would be, it wouldn't be a blemish. It would be a cyst or a boil on the reputation of Major League Baseball. And they won't allow that. It's, God forbid, what if the guy actually had an Adderall prescription? What if there was a legitimate need for it? That guy turns out to yes. be a superstar, makes it to the hall. Is that uh-huh. asterisk worthy? Do you, do you tarnish his name? Because yep. he has a he has a prescribed medical condition where he needs it. Because And then you say, well, this is a focus-enhancing drug. And, then, and that extra focus is going to help you in the box or help you on the mound. And to piggyback off of all this, if you have a TUE to use Adderall or Vyvanse and you are tested by the drug testers and it, the Adderall or Vyvanse is not in your system, they can pull the TUE uh-huh. because you are not using it as medicine on a daily basis. Where it could literally just be that a starting pitcher doesn't like taking it on days he's not starting for the pure fact that it makes him lose weight. What are we doing? And I'm going to say something kind of peeling back the curtain a little bit out of respect of privacy. I'm not going to say a name or the team that this representative or this scout was associated with, but uh, in my college days, and I'm sure Dowdy, I know for sure Dowdy went through these, your, your, your scout interviews during your pro day in college, uh, a scout for a certain team asked me point blank going down his list of questions. If I was prescribed to Adderall or Vyvanse, I was not, I do not have, ADHD or ADD. And the next question was not something completely irrelevant. It was, would you be willing to be? Well, are you and interested I, in? And I, and I, and I looked at him and I said, is that legal? He said, <laughs> just no, 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 no verbal, just, yeah. I was flabbergasted. And you know what? Had I gotten to, drafted by that team? 
I probably would have. Did I need it? No. But I just thought it was completely, completely insane that as an influent, influenceable 20, 21 year old kid, I'm getting asked that question. Yeah. Would you, would you, would you be willing to be? Super, yeah. Is it supercharging my career? Yeah. Because at that point, I? we're, we're in the, we're in the business of marketing ourselves. Like, give me a cheeseburger and a bus ticket and I'll, and I'll give you my all. Like, <laughs> sign, sign my, sign my life over here, please. So uh, that's, I thought that was pretty insane. Again, confidentiality. I'm not going to say name or team, but that's, that's a real experience. It's pretty sad, but it, it's real. To that point, I have two very different case studies of teammates that have been, one was given a TUE, unlikely that he had any ADD, ADHD, but he was somebody that went back and forth on the shuttle to the big leagues. He was young. He was a top prospect. My other friend, very, very clearly ADHD, like to the max, ask anybody. We love him to death. He's ADHD. The doctor that interviewed him told him, well, we can't prescribe this to you because you haven't taken it for so long. We're not sure what would happen if you pitched with it. You're scared he would focus better in a game that's about focus. What are we doing, baseball? Make it make sense. So yeah, you want you want that prospect wow. label is what we're getting at here. Yes. Wow. So we've sat there and pointed out uh the obvious problem, the hypocrisy behind it. Um, I thought to kind of wrap this up, Duke, you had hinted on this. Who are, uh, yeah, it's a long list, but I guess we could say top three snubs of each of us as to who hasn't gotten in the hall. I'm almost tempted to make it challenging and say, don't repeat. So, if you want to do, we could do this draft style if you wanted. Just go around the horn, everybody pick one, and just throw out I get nine names of guys that should undoubtedly be in the hall and are not going to get into the hall because of the metric and just the current system in place. So I like that. Okay, let's. Uh, we'll do the not Kyle first. Travis, pick first. Who's your, who's your number one? overall that needs to be in the hall that ain't getting there i'm gonna go um, i've already said his name i'm gonna go with the easy choice because it also strikes a little closer to home uh for those watching uh my years at the university of texas from 2012 2016 i played with this individual for uh played with this two of this individual's sons at the university of texas he himself is a proud university of texas alum so of course near and dear to my heart but also getting to know him, learning about his mentality in the game of baseball, how he approached the game, how he prepared himself, uh, the steps that he took to work his tail off to separate him from good to great to elite level. Uh, but my first pick is going to be Roger Clemens. Um, his stat line speaks for itself. His Cy Young awards speak for himself. His character speaks for himself. And the fact that he fell off the ballot and it's no chance of getting into the Hall of Fame, and he is up there in my mind. My favorite pitcher of all time in the game of baseball is Nolan Ryan. He's right up there neck and neck with Nolan Ryan in terms of impact on the game, in my opinion. Was still pitching in his low 40s. Uh, didn't quite get to like 47 or 48 like I think Nolan Ryan did, uh, but he should have an asterisk next to his name on just being a freak of nature, uh, being one of one in the game of baseball. But Roger Clemens. Yeah, I mean, couldn't agree more. Get him in the hall, players committee, whatever we got to do. Like, this is asinine. He was one of the best pitchers to ever play the game, to be completely honest. He was probably the best pitcher from, what, 1980 to 2003? Like, just bananas. So whatever, man. Dowdy, I'll let you go next. I mean, the layup. Barry Bonds. Like, Duke has already alluded to. The greatest home run hitter in the history of the game. Most home runs, most home runs in a season. He legitimately was getting intentionally walked so often that his on-base percentage was in like the 450s regularly. Like, mm -hmm. 
intentionally walked with the bases loaded. You're walking in a run because you don't want to throw to this guy and give up a grand slam. How many hitters can we t- say that about in the history of the game? Yep. Maybe just bombs? Like, it, again, and and pre all of this steroid nonsense, he was a great player by himself. Like, phenomenal player with the Pirates and when he was just young and athletic. I think it's crazy that he's not in whatever. Uh, I agree with the order that we're going into as far as hitters. I think Bonds should go in before this guy. This guy's technically still on the ballot. Um. He checks the box for 3,000 hits, 696 home runs, damn near 700 home runs, a career 295 hitter. I'm laughing when I say this because I realize how asinine the argument is that he's not in there. Alex Rodriguez, uh, this was what, the first like decade-long contract handed out in history because they knew what kind of spe- special player this guy was. Mm-hmm. You build a franchise around this guy, and he delivered. I uh, Three-time MVP, has a World Series, uh, 2009, 10-time Silver Slugger, a batting title, a travesty. A travesty. And yet another body going to the graveyard of players that will not get into the hall. Yeah, to, to the A-Rod point. He's still on the ballot and got 34% of the vote. 34%. Are you kidding me? Arguably the greatest shortstop to ever play the game. At least offensively, we'll say. 100%. And then you shift it, and then, it's, and then it just shift to third base. I would put him as one of the best third basemen to ever play the game. When you move positions and you're still one of the best, if not the best, at that position then you're not in the Hall of Fame? That goes back to why we were saying earlier, Todd Helton, again, deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, but the eh, behind it is when you have a name like A-Rod on the ballot and he gets eight, 34% of the votes and Todd Helton gets 80? What's going on? But I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for my next one. I'm really excited for my next snub. And it's... It's for a different kind of asterisk. But when I say it, I think I'm going to get some emphatic nods. Put Pete Rose in the Hall of Fame. Ooh, I like it. That's good. Career yeah. batting average of 303, 160 home runs, 1,314 RBIs, 2,165 runs scored, but the gaudiest stat of them all, 4,256 hits. We said we said the metric is three thousand hits to get into the Hall of Fame, right? Like that's that's the barometer. Like forty two hundred and fifty six hits. You know how many years he played in the big leagues? Twenty four years. We have wow. some people on the AD staff that aren't twenty four years old. <laughs> this guy put in twenty four years of service time. Forty two hundred and fifty six hits. I'm saying it again and again and again. Did he bet on baseball? Yes. Some would say that you bet on baseball every day when you play for a team because you're trying to influence the outcome of a game, right? He's not throwing games. Pete Rose was the hardest competitor to ever play baseball. He was the definition of a dirtbagger. He is the guy that he's sprinting out every ground ball he hits. He's sprinting out every pop fly he hits. He's sprinting to first base on a walk. He's getting his uniform dirty every every game in 160 games plus season. He is uh, one of the greatest of all time. And the fact that he's being held out because he bet on baseball, and we live in, in – bet on the game or bet on a team that he has a part in influencing. We live in a country where we elect politicians that are allowed to regulate or be financially tied to companies that they in turn regulate or influence the outcomes on. I mean, make it make sense. Pete Rose deserves to be in the hall of fame more than most. I'll even to further that point, Dowdy at any point in your time in the league, did you play fantasy baseball? No. For the no. exact reason, that exact reason, though, because I grew up knowing this guy is getting shafted out of the Hall of Fame because he bet on his team to win. He didn't wow. bet against it. He didn't throw games. He bet on his team to win the game. I'm not taking any of those risks, which, again, that's absolutely stupid. 
as a minor league baseball player to not be able to play fantasy baseball. Are you kidding me? Like, really? The one thing you have passion about, you're not allowed to do? Oh, you right. can play for free. It's not the same. Everybody knows that. As a real, ball real. player at any professional level, if you play fantasy baseball and there was a buy-in, in principle, it's no different than Pete Rose. Let me, uh, let me hit you with one more fact. And Go then ahead. I'm going to move off the Pete Rose bandwagon just because this, this is absolutely mind-blowing too. Baseball as a sport has been around a long, long time. They call it America's pastime for a reason. Guess how many people in their careers have hit for four, have had 4,000 hits in a career? Three. Three. Okay. Go ahead. Listen to the names. So Pete Rose, obviously. Right. That was the one. No, actually, there's only two. I was mistaken. There's only two. It's Pete Rose and Ty Cobb. The only uh, two players in the history of Major League Baseball that have had 4,000 hits. And one of them's wow. not in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. And one I, of them's never going to be in the Hall of Fame. I think the third name would hypothetically have been Ichiro, but yes. because he spent so long in Japan, yes. he wasn't able to fulfill that. Which again, he could probably still go play right now. Like watching that guy is hilarious. He's playing again, pickup games in Japan, throwing mid eighties at his age. I mean, it's mm, mm. talk about another we, freaking. We got nature. two guys, two guys at four thousand hits, and one of them's not in the shrine of baseball. We'll say. Absolutely. <sighs> wow. All right, boys. Who's next? Who do you got next? All right. Uh, I'm going back to shortstop again. And this was one of my all time favorite players as a kid. No more Garcia Parra. Really? Okay. I, how? I don't I, understand. I want to look at numbers too to validate this. I believe you. I mean, we're looking at 44 career war. He's got 1,700 hits, a career 313 average. Yes, injury bug did happen. He did not have the long term career. But when you think of generational talent, there's two shortstops in that generation. A-Rod, Garcia Parra. That was always the controversy. Who's the better shortstop in the AL? We even had Jeter, but again, he was the captain. No one threw like the skill of Jeter in those two guys. We're looking at a career OPS plus of 124. This guy raked. 882 career OPS. Like, I, again, I just don't, I don't understand. Like, what are the benchmarks that he needed to hit? Do you need to play longer? To further your point, yeah. kind of, and this is, this stat probably gets overlooked, but in, when it's done in mass, kind of like this is, I think it furthers the point. Six-time All-Star. The late 90s, early 2000s, goes back to the metric. You cannot tell the story of baseball for that era without bringing up no Mar Garcia Parra. It's there. I agree. That's a good one. Um, mine's probably not as uh, – I'm not digging as deep as you two kind of have. But uh, Mark McGuire goes into yep, mine yep. for this one. Um, yep. Personally, you would think, too, if the league had any influence, they'd advocate for him to be in because they made probably more money the summer of 1998 than they probably ever have in the history of the game. Career war of just over 62, over 500 home runs, um, 263 batting average, which I guess hurts a little bit, but 12-time All-Star, won the Home Run Derby, Rookie of the Year, quite the resume, and he ain't getting in. Broke the home run record single season for that time before old Barry came along, but again, you can't tell the story of baseball without bringing up Mark McGuire. For that era, I'm gonna throw in. Y'all want to do one more round, or do you want to cap it? I've got one, I've got one more, and then I'm done. Because okay, this is good. one again. I feel uh, feel passionate about for a different reason. Just because I, growing up, I had I had one of his jerseys. Uh, I idolized the guy. Um, I'm gonna go Rafael Palmero. Interesting. Okay, <laughs> Rafael Dang. Rafael Palmero. That is was that gonna be your next one, Dowdy? That was oh. it. Rafael Palmero again going to stats, three thousand and twenty hits, just made it over the three thousand three thousand hit threshold. Career average two eighty eight, anywhere two eighty five plus, 
again, career plus over him. Like he, I think he put in and he put in a good 18 years of service time himself as well. So average tick the box hit definitely tick the box. 1,834 career RBIs, 97 career stolen bases as a lifetime first baseman and big number 569 home runs. We talked about barometers, 3000 hits and 500 home runs. He checks both of them. And you talk about another guy, legend, generational talent, somebody that players emulated. I literally emulated my batting stance. My dad coached me on how to hit by watching Rafael Palmero hit. I was left-handed. He was left-handed. That's I modeled myself off of him. One of my idols, one of my favorite baseball players of all time, and one of the most deserved of a Hall of Fame, but due to his ties with performance-enhancing drugs, name has fallen off the ballot, and you will not see Rafael Palmero in the Hall of Fame. What a shame. Completely agree. Looking at those numbers, it is foolish how good he was, and he gets shafted. Absolutely brutal. So since you stole my third stole guy, it. snatched. I, I love that you did though, because I wanted to make sure he got his due. I'm going with somebody probably everybody knows because the summer of '98, Sammy Sosa. Oh, How do we not have the guy who, the image that forever will be instilled in my mind, immediately after 9/11, he is running through the outfield with an American flag. Are you kidding me? We don't want this guy in the hall. That's not even looking at what he did in a career with 58 war. We've got 2,400 hits. We've got 609 home runs with a 273 batting average. Are you kidding me? Again, OPS of 128 career. This isn't good enough because what? Because he played by what they wanted in the 98 season? Really? Okay. I see where we're going here, baseball. We're going to use guys and then just kind of, okay, throw them out the pasture. Yep. Turn them and burn them. Man. So I have to come up with one more. And we've already hit on some some big names that are either still on the ballot or just fell off. So like the Manny Ramirez of the world, Gary Sheffield is no longer on it. I'm going to bring up a name of controversy and be a bit of a homer that this guy should have been way more in discussions because of it. Um. I, I could see it going either way, but I think because he admitted it, he was not given the due or at least the conversation he was deserved. Um, so Homer from y'all's neck of the woods, Mr. Andy Pettit, um, five time world series champion. The numbers kind of make the conversation interesting, uh, career ERA of three, eight, but Got old, started to fade there at a certain point at the end. That definitely influenced it. Um, I just don't, we go back as much as I cannot stand Yankee fans. Um, you cannot look at baseball from, dare I say, like 1996 through the early 2000s without talking about the core four. So your Jeter, Pettit, Posada, uh, who Bernie Williams missing. Take your pick. A lot of household names off those teams, and he's at the center of it. Just a purebred winner. Came to Houston, almost did the same thing. Um, and even then, like, this guy's very vocal about his faith. Big-time character. Did the right thing and admitted it and put, like, everything out there. It was on HGH to help repair from an injury. So it's not anything you really even saw on the field. And he's wore it and faded into black into the abyss of it. Not even worth, didn't even get the conversation. And that's where I think is worth. Andy Pettit's at least worth the conversation. Uh, 110%. Couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. Not not to mention just like what he's done for baseball as a whole to this point. Oh my like gosh. the guy just keeps giving back. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure he's put in new facilities in both San Jack and what is now Houston Christian University out of his yep. own pocket. Yep. Right. Because he's just that guy. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you don't want that to be one of the guys in your hall of fame. Like you want to talk about people that are at the forefront of this game. That's like the character is not there for you because he tried to heal <laughs> yeah. from an injury. Seriously. Like, dude, get your head out of the sand folks. That's what most people don't realize is that even during this steroid era, the name of the game for players first and foremost is recovery. When you're playing 
almost every day and you have maybe one at absolute most two off days in a month and you are going every day or as a pitcher bullpen guy you're ready to you almost have to be ready almost every day starter yeah you pitch once every five days but on that fifth day you are literally dying on that field you are giving your all your entire self on that field position guys you're going every day to be able to recover from that and give fans what they pay their hard-earned money to go see and what the MLB expects from a product in the MLB and to be a great for a longer period of time, you need something that's going to help you recover. Guys weren't taking this so they could say, okay, well, I'm going to bench 50, 75, 50, 75 pounds more and I'm going to hit 30 more home runs. It doesn't work like that. They're just trying to recover to get to the next day and they're added side effects that it makes you grossly stronger. Okay. They all knew the side effects of what it meant to your body long-term, but we're willing to do it to recover short-term to fulfill their dream, to take themselves to the next level. And I would still say Dowdy to this day, it's not as drastic a measures, but there are a lot of guys that that's the, that's the hunt. That's the secret formula, finding what is going to help you recover the best every outing or every day. 100 percent that that is the name of the game as any baseball player because it's a grind the entire season just beats you down physically mentally how can you recover in between Mm -hmm. the game that gets over at midnight and then you got to be at the field the next morning at 10 a.m how do you get recovered fully in less than 12 hours Mm -hmm. because physiologically not possible nope not at all we could start going down a rabbit trail, pushing yes, this into could. what what we'll have to save for another conversation. But things that they want to change about the game, the rules, shortening the season, all that sort of stuff. That's really Pandora's What's up, box. Rendon? <laughs> yeah. No joke. <laughs> no joke. What a comment. What a yeah. comment, dude. What a comment. Oh. Right. Well, boys, uh, as far as content goes, that's uh, – that's a lot. I think we did good on that. Let's pay the bills before we get out of here. Baseballism. If you haven't yet, go to baseballism.com. You see Mr. Duke's shirt right there. I've got uh, the beast lid on. Uh, go there before the season starts. This is prime time. Get your orders in to get ready for baseball season. Use code AD15 at checkout to get 15% off. Uh, it's good stuff. Good quality. Love it. I will be going back to get another order soon. Um, go visit our buddies over at Baseballism. But for big shout out, big shout out. Um, for our own Mr. Travis Duke, Mr. Kyle Dowdy, and Clancy, this has been Pen Pals. Thanks for tuning in, y'all.